All right, let's get to technology now. NVIDIA is on course to sell about $12 billion worth of artificial intelligence chips uh, to China, or rather in China, despite U.S. export controls that have throttled its business in one of the world's biggest semiconductor markets. Now, the $3 trillion Silicon Valley Group will, over the coming months, deliver more than a million of its new H20 chi H20 chips which are costs, as you can see, they're between twelve to thirteen thousand dollars. So let's get to our guest because there's a whole lot to discuss as far as artificial intelligence is concerned. Doctor Olumide Okubadejo, who has a PhD in AI and is also the uh, head of product at Sabi. Doctor, you're very welcome. Good morning uh, to you. It's very, it's my pleasure to be here. Great to have you. A uh, whole lot to discuss. Um, what do you make of this development? How is it that, or rather, what do you make of Nvidia being projected to be mm -hmm. able to make this type of sales despite the geopolitical tensions between the US and uh, China? I think there's a political play and then there's a business play and then we need to be able to look at the entire landscape of it. What kind of chips are they selling to China? They're selling the H20 chips, right? The processing of these chips is much lower, but then the connectivity is the same as the A100 chips which, uh, and the H100 chips, which uh, NVIDIA is known for. Um, and, you know, um, China would be able to stack these chips to maybe do some trainings, maybe not the uh, large language models that we're used to, but you know, that is the business play. They still want to be able to control that market, so they're going to give them this low-end chips that you know can maybe give you this mid-range AIs, not with uh, a lot of um, space on their models, not a lot of processing capacity, but they want to be able to control the LLMs large language models, large music models, all the large models that they feel would uh, define how uh, the data play and the AI play is going to be in the next uh, few years. All right, so you're a player in this space. Yeah. You obviously want to see AI expand globally. Is of the course. US being fair or is there a justification for these export controls <sighs> to restrict to China? That's a very difficult question. But then I, there's this the thing. Everybody's trying to protect you know, their sovereignty, their data, and U.S. has imposed this export control to be able to define how or you know, control how China, you know, works with this LLMs, the kind of models that they're able to churn out. So, in a sense, there's that justification from a perspective of national security. Um, but in a sense, uh, I really don't see how that stops, you know, the play because what that's just going to do is China is going to uh, start to build their own models. They're going to get to a point where they're able to have their own chips, you know, just like we saw with the EV market. Now China is sort the of the dominant lead. player. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is how I see that it's going to go. Okay, so um, you know us in the media, we like to hype stuff up. So we have a showdown, a chart between, um, I want you to take a look. I don't know if you can pick winners here or see how this is going. This is an extension of my prior question to you. So you've yeah. got the 10 cents, the Alibabas, the bite dances versus the open AIs, the Microsofts, the Meta. Yeah. Um, is this, are we going to get more innovation from this or is it going to be hampered by geopolitics? Are you excited to see the showdown? Who wins? How do you see it? Uh, I, I think that looking at AI generally, it's, it's not really a winner in terms of like the big models because what the US has successfully done is hamper how you know, China um, develops their own large language models. Um, but one of the things that you see is there's a market for mid-range models, mid-sized models, there's a market for small size models. And I feel like in that space, and that's one of the things, the EVs are going to be using more mid-range and small size models, and so it doesn't really stop AI development or innovation in that space. Um, what we're going to see is that I feel China and, and these companies that are affiliated, they're going to win in that space. We're already seeing them winning in that space. Um, but we're going to see some restriction in the large language model space and the large uh, model space because, of course, there's the restriction on processing that has been imposed by, uh, you know, NVIDIA not being able to ship their chips to, to China. What about regulations? Because mm -hmm. we heard earlier this week that France, with all the, they have their own big election coming up on Sunday yeah, or so, um, yeah, yeah. is looking to bring antitrust, you know, uh, you know, charges against NVIDIA. And also, I think the Department of Justice in the U.S. is looking at NVIDIA, OpenAI, Microsoft. Yeah. So what do you make of that as far as, you know, will that hamper innovation? And then is NVIDIA on its way to a monopoly in that space and regulation catching up? I think NVIDIA is already at the stage of monopoly. <laughs> I mean, I mean, it's too late. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and that is one of the things about the AI space, right? Regulation is always going to be behind, you know, innovation at yeah. some point. Um, if you look at the report, uh, France is bringing antitrust based on the CUDA, which is the software that runs on, you know, the, uh, the, uh, 
the chips, right? And they've been building this since 2007. They've been dominant in that market since 2007. And we're just opening our eyes to it. And I, I, I think that, that it really isn't going to happen anything. They're going to slap fines on them, but they're still going to be dominant in that market as we have seen. Um, venture capital funding in the US mm -hmm. for artificial intelligence. I think we have the numbers. Um, what was it? Was it 97 point so billion in 2021? Okay, we have the numbers now. Let me remember. Yeah, okay, it was 55.6 billion Q2 of this year, 47% climb from uh, the prior quarter, highest total in two years. But as you can see, the record high was 97, was, you know, 97 billion, almost double in 2021. And then the record low, of course, 35. Um, do you think it's on, it's on a rising trajectory? Can it be maintained? Uh, yeah, it can. Uh, for how long, I do not know. Yeah. But the thing I know right now is the business space is awash with everyone just wants something AI. You know, people are starting to realize that the only way that they can win, that the only way that they can streamline, uh, they can increase growth, you know, that they can uh, bring innovation into their, into their product, their business, is by introducing some sort of AI. And for venture capitalists, it's, it's sort of a single thing. Do you have AI or do you not have AI? Are you going to be winning? in the next few years or are you not going to be winning in the next few years so um, we're going to see that happening a lot uh, this year maybe next year especially with you know how the large language models there's that war going on and and there's also this war going on within the business space with everyone saying if you're bringing a business model to me and you're not using AI am I sure you're still going to be around in the next few years yeah so we're gonna see that going on this year maybe next year uh, but I don't know how long uh, we're going to have that upward trajectory. So, okay, so that's private sector money in the U.S. It that's is, funding it is, this thing. It so is. How, how do we replicate? I mean, I know the, we, we, of course, covered the artificial intelligence conference that was held in Abuja. Uh, yeah. Arise News was in Abuja yeah. for the digital economy. Mm -hmm. Dr. Boston Tijani running that. Yeah. But that's public sector. They're trying to get how, you know, how do you, how do you develop that without that kind of private sector money? Uh, so, so in, in Nigeria, it's still going to be a mix of public and private sector. We still need the public sector to give the regulations and, and all the, the, the infrastructure that allows for private sector growth. Then we need uh, um, this collaboration between public and private sector in that if you are building a model, what is the way that you can make that model not just available for your company, but available at a global stage or maybe for a, a educational purposes, right? So we need that public private sector partnership, but it might not be if, uh, in the sense of, hey, uh, we're going to give you money or you're going to fund everything. It might be from the perspective of education. It might be from the perspective of you build it, but somehow we have this deal where it's quasi open source. You know, someone else can use it. Uh, and, you know, you have that uh, private sector growth and more people can start to innovate with maybe the model that a bigger player has, has built. Um, but it starts from the regulation space, even before the money space, you need uh, the infrastructure, you need the regulations to be able to prop up you know, a, a, a private sector to be able to build this model. But I, I feel like most of the model building will be in the private sector space, but we need that collaboration more than competition now, and, and we need the public sector to, to, to set the trend. Yeah. All right, look, like I said, you, you have a PhD in this field. How do you see the education side of things developing here in Nigeria? I mean public schools got their funding issues yeah. and everything. How, how do you see that moving forward? Um, so I think it starts with people like us. Yeah. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> You're the savior, right? Yeah. Yeah. I think it starts with people like us because it gets very expensive. So uh, we, we, we burn a lot of money right now. We can have this collaboration between uh, public and private sector. I always come back to this, where, where schools are not just, oh, I have a teacher, I have a lecturer who is you know, just you know, uh, domiciled in my school. Um, even right now, as is, I, you know, sometimes I still teach in a school in Paris. Oh, okay. You, yeah, you, 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 well, we need you to teach here. <laughs> <laughs> if they can pay you the salary that you command in Paris. Yeah. So, so, yeah. But, but this is, this is entirely not costly, right? It's just the, the government has said like a, a structure where people from the private sector can come, on, come in for maybe a week, a couple of days, teach these courses and, and the students can benefit from it. So we, we can always do more with this collaboration and this uh, private sector collaboration, uh, uh, public-private sector collaboration as it is. But, uh, but I see education, if we don't latch onto that, um, then would, would always be behind. Yeah, great stuff. Uh, I'm glad I caught you while you were here in Lagos. Uh, Dr. <laughs> Olumide Okubadejo, uh, thank you so much, the uh, head of product at Sabi. Appreciate your insights on AI, and we hope thank to have you back. Thank you very much. You're a wealth of knowledge in this field. Thanks. For